Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking with Dr. Daniel Weiss, art historian, former president of Haverford College and Lafayette College, current Homewood professor of the humanities at Johns Hopkins University, and president emeritus of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he served from 2015 to uh, 2023. Dan, it's so great to have you here. I'm so excited to be talking with the man himself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. I'm delighted to be here with you. Much appreciated. So we're going to talk about why museums matter. And in, in, before the show, before the recording started, we were chatting about this idea of museums having gone through various stages of formation all the way through to today's uh, world in which the world is so interconnected through um, the internet and through social media and people have access to knowledge instantaneously, which they did not have even 50 years ago. Talk a little bit about how you see the museum sector in an overarching sense, um, having developed through your career. Sure. Well, I'm delighted to do that. And I will say that, that, um, one of the issues I've been interested in in my work as a leader at the Met and as a scholar is the history of the museum idea generally. We take these institutions for granted. They're vital parts of our community. We rely on them for all kinds of things that we'll, we can talk about today. But they have a very long history. And I was interested in why are they so important in societies of all kinds across all cultures in all of history? And um, and we can talk about that history in a moment, but as a result of that long-standing history and that dependence that people have on creating institutions that allow them to understand and celebrate their own and other cultures, to engage with, with cultural objects and cultural themes in ways that enriches and enlivens their experience, they have come to be seen as essential in ways that's really quite startling in some ways. And in the modern world, in the world we live in today, and perhaps especially in the years post-COVID, museums have been changing very, very rapidly. And there are all kinds of questions about where they're headed. But what's not at, at stake, in my view, is their importance, that they provide a place and an opportunity for people to come together to study and reflect on their own history, their own identity, their own culture, and the culture of others in ways that is... Uh, really quite essential to the human condition. So as we think about all the things that are changing and what might go away in the age of artificial intelligence, I have zero concern that museums will be right where they've been. They'll be different, but they're gonna be here with us. You know, I look at your, your career unfolding as an educator, always an educator, and then as, as a manager of experiences in which you are bringing people together with objects that function as uh, touch points for our our understanding of ourselves, our culture, our history. Talk a little bit about this idea of collecting those touch points from across different cultures into one institution, and then the the actual process of having somebody come in and being in conversation, being in physical proximity with those touch points, because that's a lot different than looking at something on a screen. Yes, it is. It, it very much is. And, and I will say that as a scholar, I'm, I'm an art historian by training and a medievalist and classicist in, by background in the areas in which I taught and did research. And so I've studied the ancient history and the medieval history of collecting. And what is it about the, the primacy of objects that is so important to us? And that has always been the case, always. In, in all cultures and all societies, there's something fundamental about what we get out of experiencing objects and works of art firsthand. We live in a digital age today where there's no question you can produce digital reproductions of works of art that are almost as good as the real thing. But that has done nothing to diminish the enthusiasm that people have for seeing the real thing. So museums provide an opportunity for people to connect in a direct and immediate way with objects that is uh, it might be informed by their digital experience. That is to say, they look at a lot of images, they like being on the web and they see this stuff. That only makes them more interested in seeing the real thing. It never substitutes for, well, I saw the Mona Lisa on the screen. I don't need to go to Paris and see it. It doesn't work like that. That in the age of digital exploration, 
visitation in museums continues to grow. So one part of your question is the importance of coming into contact directly with objects. And it can, for many people, be almost a spiritual experience where they have the opportunity to be, to see a work of art unmediated by anything else. And let me just say a word about that. When somebody sees a work of art from, let's say, the ancient world, they're looking directly at the object that was made in that time by that artist. That was, was a, not for was music. There, there was a person was there. With, with a brush, with a stylus, with um, some tools to, um, to shape marble. There was a person. That was that they made choices. Yes, so exactly. At, at the Hellenistic uh, pyramid uh, period, where you had human form being very naturalistic, then you go into the the age of Charlemagne, where the forms were more representational. Right? People are making choices, and you're seeing those choices. You're experiencing them in its three D. You can look around an object. Uh, exactly. And it's unmediated. You're not seeing the experience as it's interpreted by someone else. When you go to see the New York Philharmonic play Beethoven, you're listening to the New York Philharmonic's interpretation of what Beethoven wrote down. But when you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to see those Hellenistic objects that you're describing, you're looking directly at the object made by the artist. So I think people gravitate to that kind of, of direct and unmediated experience, whether it's ancient art or modern art. So one purpose that museums play is it gives them that access. Your other part of your question was about collections of objects. What does that mean? And I think for museums like the Metropolitan, which are very large comprehensive institutions with many collections, it gives people the opportunity to learn about cultures they didn't necessarily know about before, and crucially, to see connections that might not have otherwise been obvious. The ancient Egyptians were doing much the same thing that the modern Bohemians were doing in, in uh, Greenwich Village, that there's, there's the same fundamental questions that they're exploring. And as a result, you learn something about how, how interconnected we are across time and space. When you take a look at, at, at a, a huge institution like the Metropolitan Museum, where you do have the ability to create a compare and contrast experience, of uh, an audience member, a visitor being able to walk from gallery to gallery and have these different experiences versus a smaller museum where you're serving on the board of the Academy Art Museum. Talk a little bit about how you see these institutions interconnecting so that the visitor who is going to move from a smaller museum in some part of the country into a metropolitan area like New York or the Art Institute of Chicago or LACMA or any of the other, you know, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, how those experiences are different and how they hang together in one ecosystem? Yes, a great question. So given what we just said about the ways in which people are drawn to objects and to having those experiences, there are myriad ways in which they can have those kinds of experiences. And the beauty of the museum movement particularly as it's been developed in the United States, where it is the most dynamic and well-developed of anywhere in the world. There are something like, I don't know, 45 or 50,000 museums in the United States. They're all different. Every one of them is different. Even the big ones, they're different. So each time you go into a museum, you have an opportunity to encounter works of art in a different way. The Academy Art Museum, which is a very small community-focused museum, gives people an opportunity to have an immersive experience with a series of objects or a small exhibition in community with people that they might know. It combines also the opportunity for people to take courses in art while they're there. It's, it's a, an institution that does that. And those experiences in that institution are every bit as important to Easton, Maryland, as the Metropolitan is to the citizens of New York. So there's great diversity in the kinds of institutions that are out there. For people in the museum profession, and for those who appreciate museums, part of the joy is seeing how they enact their missions differently. The Art Institute in Chicago is very, very different from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Yes. They're all wonderful, but they're really different. So there's a creative question as to how do you tell stories in ways that builds on the specific collections we have, the audiences that we serve. And that's what makes museum work so interesting. And whose story you tell, right? Previously, 
Yeah. Um, we were uh, addressing as a sector, we were addressing a certain audience. The audience has changed and their perspective of that audience has changed significantly. So the same works, the same stories, I'm sorry, the same works can tell different stories than we would have told years ago. Does that affect the curatorial teams that you hire? Yes, it does. I think the work has gotten more interesting because institutions have recognized there is no such thing as one audience. There are many, many different There's audiences. There's no such thing as one story, right? Pardon? There's no such thing as one story. There's not the right no. story. No, there's no such thing as one story. So how do you tell, how do you present objects in a way that allows people who, to encounter them based on where they're coming from and their level of expertise? And at the Metropolitan, we did it in a certain way, but every institution does. You never want to turn people away because the information is so elevated that they, they don't feel that they're worthy of seeing it. But you also don't want to present the information or the stories in ways that are so rudimentary that it turns people away who might know something. So that's also part of the craft and the professionalism of working in museums to figure out what are the objects, what are the stories we want to tell, who gets to tell them, and how are they being told, and who are the audiences that are going to encounter these things. And all of that, when it works well, it comes together in a way that's really quite inspiring. It also connects to how you actually present the art and how you hang your galleries. I've had these experiences where I've gone into mid-sized museums, and I find that the galleries that are the most famous galleries with, with uh, recognized works, those galleries are beginning to change because the works that used to be hung in the hallways that were marginalized, that those works are over time being recognized as being great works. And now they're being moved from those hallways into, the, into a central space. And that creates a totally different dialogue amongst the works and how the audiences actually traverse the works changes considerably as well. Do you experience that where, where your people, um, your colleagues have this aha moment and start saying, well, wait a second, all these quote best practices, those are straight jackets. We need to query those practices. Yeah, I think that does happen. And museums and the people who work in them live in the world around us. So as our society, shapes different views about the world and their experience, and as it develops maybe different ways of appreciating aesthetic experiences, then tastes change. Remember when the first Impressionist pictures appeared in Paris, they were thought of as trash, that this was utterly irresponsible. But no one would have uh, been more surprised than maybe Monet and Renoir to know that 25 years from now, you guys are going to be very, very rich and the top of the heap. So tastes change. And what museum professionals try to do is use their own expertise to make judgments about what constitutes original contributions and high quality presentations, but also they watch the world around them to see how are people responding, what is society's changing values and norms, so that in the world we live in today, for example, if you wanted to buy a masterpiece by a great Italian painter, or you wanted to buy a painting by Basquiat, the painting by Basquiat would cost three times what the Italian Renaissance masterpiece would cost. 20 years ago, that would have been nonsense. But now it's changed. People have different values around those things. So we live in the real world, and we try to preserve history and tell stories, but also to reflect the ways in which our own society is evolving. Yeah, Keith Herring, just, you know, this weird guy who was, who was doing street art, you know, on walls and on, you know, and, and we have uh, street artists who are doing, who, who just have this, these pop-up uh, works that are now um, creating uh, great conversation and, and uh, driving huge value. Yes. Um, how do you feel about, uh, you know, this whole Van Gogh thing that, that where they had this multimedia uh, show um, of yeah. Van Gogh and it's, it's all projected. It's not, and there's music and there's, it's, it's immersive and it's, it's kind of a interesting take. How do you feel about those types of experiences of an artist's work? It's not created by an artist, but it's created by other producers, other artists who are um, who are exploring themselves, but also providing that exploration to visitors. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting experiment, and I, I think any aesthetic experience is a good thing. 
that providing people an opportunity to look and see in new ways, to challenge their assumptions about what they might otherwise have, have thought about and when they look at these objects, that's all to the good. And then people can decide for themselves what they find most meaningful or most inspiring. And as I say, I think there's no question that looking at a painting by Vincent van Gogh in a gallery, just you and the object, is a sublime experience that cannot be exceeded in any way. But that doesn't mean that the immersive Van Gogh experience is a bad idea. It's just a different way of inviting people to look at Van Gogh's work. And um, I'm a very, very keen to invite and support creative expressions of all kinds, because what we have learned from the fullness of time is that the more people have those kind of experiences, it enriches the quality of their lives and heightens their understanding. So the, the immersive Van Gogh thing isn't really my thing, but I'm perfectly happy to, to see it thriving and having people go. And more often than not, after that, they come to the art museum to see what inspired that work. Do you feel that we as a society are encouraging our artists sufficiently and supporting our artists sufficiently, our contemporary artists, for the creation of new work? Or do, or do you feel like um, we are neglecting the importance of art for uh, practical um, uh, money-making uh, disciplines. This whole idea of liberal arts is becoming, in my way of thinking, it's becoming a bit eroded, right? People are looking on return on investment on education, and an education is becoming so incredibly expensive that maybe we're forced into that. What about this meandering, where we can meander? topic. Are you talking about the liberal arts in terms of education or, or the field of art? I'm talking about the intersectionality between your career as a art museum leader and uh -huh. as an education professional. This whole idea of creation of new art and not just the study of, of past yeah. art? Yeah, well, I think overall our society is challenged in significant ways uh, around everything is too, I think, driven by markets and valuation, and that the, the field of art is corrupted in a very significant way by the proliferation of massive amounts of money. Many of the people who collect art, they have great wealth, and they don't really know what they're collecting. They're buying things that advisors are telling them to buy because they either they're, they're interested in keeping up with their friends or because they think it's a good investment that someone's advising them, like buying real estate or anything else. And as a result of that, the, the market is very much bifurcated, the field of art. There's a very small number of artists who are extraordinarily successful, making tons of money. And then there are lots of artists doing really interesting work who struggle mightily. And it would be great to live in a society where there's more opportunity for creative expression in a sustainable way by individuals drawn to that kind of work without having them have to sacrifice everything or play cynical games in order to get noticed. A lot of what artists do is try to figure out ways to create a buzz around themselves in order for the, the, the taste makers and the people with who control the, the galleries to notice them. So I think big money and um, markets has corrupted much in our society and it has done the same in art. You in some ways see the same thing in universities as the cost of higher education has gotten so high, many families say, I don't want my child to study art history. They need to go to law school or medical school to justify this investment. But a liberal education is a luxury we can't afford. So I think that is also a problem. There are various ways people are working around that. But our society doesn't benefit by having that kind of crass commercialism dominate everything we do. Should museums be trying to foster this kind of embrace of all knowledge, the ability to muse and to browse and to be exposed and the value of that. Um, you know, I'm thinking now that content creators, whether they are artists, visual artists, or musical artists, or uh, literary artists, or reporters, their uh, livelihoods are being threatened because you can get something that visually looks similar by coming out of a computer. And the ability to create three-dimensionally rendered things um, will will only drive that forward. So at a certain point, the you know, it begs the question of, of what is the meaning of art and what is art if anything could be reproduced 
And then through some sort of a magic box, you can basically say to somebody, um, make an original work I, or an AI, make an original work that, that draws from these various traditions. And then you get this entirely original work that is rendered on a canvas or rendered, uh, rendered in 3D in marble. Um, how, do you, how do you look at that, whole, all these trends that we're all grappling with? Yeah, I think your question raises two themes, both of which interest me greatly. Um, the first is, what constitutes meaningful and interesting art? And can AI ever be able to produce art that is original in ways that will interest us? And my own instinct is no. It will do. It, it can create things that will that will entertain us. But when we look at works of art, ultimately, I think what we're interested in is the humanity behind the creative expression. That human beings are preoccupied above all else with other human beings. That we that's who we how we're wired. So wanting to see a work of art up close is because somehow you want to commune with the creative force that that generated it. And no matter how sophisticated the AI is, it isn't going to do that. So I think what we'll find is, is that as we see this proliferation of advanced technologies that do that sort of generative work, it will be used in ways that, that, is, not commit, that is not competitive with human expression that artists create in various ways. Um, I don't think we're going to be going to movies that are, that are written, directed, and starred in by AI. There's, there's, there's a, a human element in all of these things that is what genius is, and machines can't produce that. That's one observation. Um, the other is what museums do that make them different from almost any other institution. And this is the second part of the question as I, as I heard you. They're the, among the only places where everybody is welcome to participate in a learning experience. That unlike say a university where you, it's for the students and the faculty and sometimes the public, the work of the museum is accessible to all. And it provides therefore all of us an opportunity together to experience works of art, to talk about them, to debate them, to appreciate them, to learn from them. And there are no barriers to entry. And whoever wants to come up the stairs can come in the museum in most cases. And, and I think therefore they provide a community purpose that is really distinctive in our society. And that's one reason why there has been such a proliferation of museums in the last generation in our country, because people appreciate that opportunity. And it will remain, even as, as I say, as AI continues to develop. I think that's so important. What uh, the, this this point that you're making of creating a place where people can come together across different divisions, because we all have particular professions, we have particular uh, uh, circles of acquaintance that we have, we live in a particular zip code or community, <clears throat> but here we can actually come together and just sort of be together and experience things together, right? Yeah. And that's the thing that really we're we're all seeking. We're seeking these common experiences. It is as much of the art, if it, as it were, as, as what the artists create. The art of creating that environment where people can come together and commune is really the museum director's role, isn't it? Yes, it is. Museums are venues. They're places for community to come together and have that shared experience. There's something about our need, our inexorable need to connect with each other, to have shared experiences. And museums provide that opportunity around works of art. That's why I'm not worried about their future. Unless we rewire human beings completely, they're not going anywhere. So is the museum in a sense also a performance art? Does the curtain go up every day when the doors open and you have that day and those experience, that audience, is they're not only visitors to objects, that's Part of really that cool. museum is fostering that interaction amongst the audience members, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great way of putting it. And I think, yes, we talk about, we stopped talking, when I got to the Met, we stopped talking about visitors. And we started talking about the museum experience. What do we want people who come to, to have happen for them when they're there? And how can, we need to be mindful and respectful of the fact that many of those people who are coming into our building have never been there before and may never come again. So how do we make this a day they'll never forget that inspires them in ways that is uh, very, very fulfilling? And that's not just a visitor coming in to see three paintings and going for lunch. It's something very different. 
you're right. It is a performance in the end. I have loved this conversation, Dan. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Dan Weiss, Dr. Dan Weiss, art historian, former president of Haverford and Lafayette College, current homework professor of the humanities at Johns Hopkins, and president emeritus of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This has just been fabulous. And the, the thing that I really admire about your career, Dan, is that you have stayed true to these ideas Regardless as to which positions you have, you have basically helped people to experience this and to evolve the sector, this idea of, of art, artists, art history, the point of creation, the person that is actually doing the creating, the audience member, the visitor who has experienced it. This is, it, it's sort of a, a really interesting at highs, at big scales and at smaller scales, it's a very interesting and dedicated career that you've led. And I'm just so happy that you're able to share some of your insights with us today. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's been a great pleasure to be with you to talk about all of this. And uh, I'm very grateful for the time, too.